Good evening and welcome to our evening service. Good evening, welcome to our, oh, we're gonna see if that's turned off. Testing, test, there we go. Welcome to our evening service, glad to have all of you with us. Glad for all of those joining us online as well. Continue to be in prayer for Pastor, he's still not feeling the greatest, so continue to be in prayer for him. A couple of announcements, again remember, EBBI semester begins tomorrow. So let's be in prayer for all the students that are still traveling and are going to be here for the semester. Looking forward to that. Men's prayer meeting on 7 a.m. on this coming Tuesday. Deacons, we have our the deacons meeting at 7 p.m. tonight. Or, excuse me, Tuesday night, not tonight, Tuesday night. Wednesday, we have a prayer meeting with kids on a mission beginning up again at 7. And then teens, remember the teen retreat that's at Windcrest this Friday and Saturday. We're looking forward to a couple of things coming up further down the line, which I already announced this morning, so I won't take time to announce those. We're going to start off, though, with a song singing hymn number 313. We're marching to Zion. Let's all stand as we sing the first, the second, and fourth of this song. Love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, and thus around the throne, we're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. To fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion. Upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Please remain silent for prayer. I've asked David Freeman to come pray for us tonight. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this time tonight. Lord, we pray that you would bless this service, that you would use it. Lord, I pray that we would not be hearers only, that we would be doers of the word, that we would apply the word that we hear tonight to our hearts. And Lord, that we would use this word as well as an encouragement to others. And Lord, tonight we ask your blessing upon this service, that you'd use it in a great and powerful way, in ways that we didn't even think or imagine. And Lord, we commit this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe Cedar. Our next song is uh, one of our hymn of the month songs we sung a couple months ago. To live or die, we're going to sing all three verses of this song. To live is Christ. I long to spend my might and time to worship Him. I'll give. Labors at your feet to 
Christ the eternal gain to wake and never sleep again. I will not fear the feeble grave, the pathway to my Savior's face. Lord, help me use my fleeting breath to honor you through life or death. And when my heart drums its last beat, I'll lay my labors at your feet. To live or die, it's all the same, for Christ consumes me either way. If I should live, I'll live for him, and if I die, I'll live again. Lord, help me When my heart drums its last beat, nor play my labors at your feet. Our next song is hymn number 371, A Passion for Thee. We're going to sing all verses of this song. of that, of course, there, not just to serve, but to love thee with all of my heart, and it's a great reminder to not just get busy about things of the, the Lord, but to be having your whole heart in it and loving to continue serving the Lord. We have one more song before Kevin comes and preaches, which is hymn 145, Love As I Loved. Let's all stand as we sing this one. We're going to sing all verses of this song, Love As I Loved.
I pushed them all away They were just a senseless bother Till I heard the Savior say Maybe seated, and this time we have Keegan to come preach to us tonight. So Keegan, you come ahead. Just make sure I'm turned on. There we go. Good evening. Before I get into our uh, service tonight, I just wanted to make a mention. Uh, Dee had reminded me or mentioned to me a prayer request. Uh, Mrs. Reason, uh, Pastor Reason's wife down at Forest Glen, had taken a fall. So just be in prayer for her. She's in recovery right now or awaiting surgery. Might want to consult with Dee about the details, but just be in prayer for her tonight. She's uh, going to be dealing with a long recovery. As I prepared for tonight, I was reminded about a passage that I was reading through this week. The passage is Psalm 3. As I was reading through it, something came out to the forefront of my mind that I wanted to kind of express to me, is that's the background of David. I don't know about you, but I find that when I'm listening to those of, of advanced years, I pay attention a lot closer. When you're gaining advice from somebody who has been there before, you have a tendency to listen a little bit closer. They've been there. They've done it. The advice that they are giving you is tried. It's true. It's something to give heed to, pay attention to. As a a child, I was not an individual who had a lot of fellowship with people of my own age. I had a tendency of either gathering or being gathered by the older people in my church. And I got a lot of opportunities of hearing that grandfatherly wisdom. That, that knowledge and those tidbits, those advice that came from years and years of living in God's Word. And doing things God's way. And it gave me a, a, a value for that information. And I know there's, there's every one of you has that experience, whether it be a father, a grandfather, a, a saint in the church that has imparted wisdom to you and you just couldn't take your eyes off of them when they were talking to you. They may have said it ten times to you before, but you just couldn't help but pay attention. For me, when I read the Psalms of David, that's the feeling I get. God's Word is powerful. Any part that you read has power to it, but there's something unique when David sits down and writes a psalm about confidence in the time of storm that really comes out to you. David was a man who had suffered. David was a man who was a lowly shepherd who was chosen by God to do something amazing and spectacular. We were just teaching this last Sunday uh, with the with kids down in junior church about David and Goliath. I was just reminded about the the immense triumphs that David had in his life. He was a man of victory. He was a man of of success. But he was a man who had faced many, many trials. A man who understood the painful reality of persecution. A man who understood being, being a stranger in his own land. A man who understood the hurt and pain that this world brings with it. And a man who understood feeling like all odds are against you. And yet, in Psalm 3, during one of the most trying times of David's life, we get this amazing picture of where our confidence can be in the middle of turmoil. So turn with me to Psalm, chapter, or Psalm 3. We're going to read verse 1 to 8, the entirety of the psalm tonight. And be encouraged by the man who has been there before and faced the onslaught of the enemy and still found his confidence in his Lord. Let's go to the Word of God. Lord, how many are they 
How are they increased that are, trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my hand, head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he, he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept, and I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me, against, round, <clears throat> against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Let's go to the Lord in word of prayer tonight. Father, I pray as we go into your word that you'll burden our hearts with its truth, that you encourage us with its truth, Lord. Help us to see that no matter what we face in this life, we can find our confidence and our assurance in you and you alone. Thank you for the time that we have here to be in your word and to be encouraging one another. Pray you'll be with us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. There's an interesting reality that comes with Psalm 3. Psalm 3 is, is given a title. And in your Bibles, you likely read it. Some of your Bibles may have included it as a tag end or a beginning part to verse number 1. And that title is a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. This gives us a very specific time stamp for when this psalm was written and what the events surrounding this psalm were. Remember in our, in our opener, we, we remind ourselves about the fact that words coming from wisdom that has been there before seem so much more powerful to us. And as you read through this Psalm of David, knowing the circumstance which he wrote it in brings such an amazing power to the words of confidence that he had. Because what was he dealing with? What was he, what was he surrounded by at this time? It was written during a time where he was fleeing from the, the betrayal and the treacherous acts of his son. If you're not familiar with the history of David and the life at this point in his life, he had been a, a king for many years at this state. He had been in God's kingdom, ruling over God's people. He had, he had seen victories. He had seen losses. He had, he has, he had, um, this would be after his rebellion against God. This would be after all of those situations in his life. He had seen the victory of God. He had seen the chastisement of God. He had felt the restoration in God. And right there, near the, nearing on the tail end of his kingship, he's going to feel the sting of betrayal. Because his son, who is frustrated and mad about how his father had dealt with a situation between his brother and sister, his son, who is, who is upset and mad at his father for the way he handled things or didn't, is going to enact his revenge against his father. Considering him ill fit for the throne, he's going to try to establish his own kingship and usurp the throne of his own dad. And he does this. That's the that's settled context we are introduced to with this psalm. Absalom, the son of David, had gathered the disgruntled, the upset, the frustrated amongst the nation of Israel and had rallied them against his own father in a coup to rebel and throw down the God-established rule of David. In 2 Samuel 15, we get this story. We are introduced to this reality. We're going to jump down a little bit of a ways in the passage to just look at the aspect of, of the message that comes to David. A messenger came to David in, in 2 Samuel 15, verse 13. It says, And there came a messenger to David, saying, The heart of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him in Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not, not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest, we, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. 
This is what's going on in David's life. This is the betrayal, son against father. And it wasn't just an uprising. It wasn't just one day Absalom decided to rally all of his buddies together to go against his father. It wasn't the adolescent immaturity of a young son against his father. This was planned. The model of of Absalom's rebellion was to rally all those who had something against the king. In fact, earlier in uh, 2 Samuel 15, we see the, the method, the mode that Absalom used to build this force. Early on in chapter 2, it says, And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gates. And it was so that when a man, any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputy of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so, that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. This was a long process. This was a conniving process. If this was just done by one of your subjects, it would be hard enough to deal with as a king. But to have this this utter betrayal, this this process of sitting at the city gates where, where, where judgments were passed, where laws were made, where men of of the court would stand to to, to, uh, judge between the people for the king's sake, to stand at the gate of the city as people came by saying, hey, come over here. What's your problem, man? What's what's ailing you? I'm going to the king. I I have have an issue with my brother. And I'm I'm going to the king for judgment. Oh, the king's not going to hear you. The king doesn't have anybody to hear your problem. I'll I'll hear your problem. Listen to me. I care for you. If I was judge, you'd have justice. Didn't matter what they said. Didn't matter if their their problem was something of complete sin and debauchery. Didn't matter if they were right or wrong. Absalom sucked up to these people and said, I'm on your side. If I were king, you'd win. To have anybody in your kingdom betray you in such a way would be a heartbreaking hit to a ruler. Now you parents, don't think of this as just a man doing this who's betraying you. This is your son who you invested the wisdom that God had granted you. Who you had loved from his birth. Who you raised and was raised around you. This was your flesh and blood who is now turning against you. In the most evil way possible. This is a complete betrayal. This is, this is a, a point of low in David's life. And not only was it a point of low, it was a point of low that looked like it was all over for him. Absalom didn't just get 600 guys to come with him. Absalom had amassed a massive army to come against David. To the point where David only answer to the problem was we have to leave. We have to flee out of the city. We do not have the force, we do not have the trust of Israel to be able to go up against Absalom. We have to flee. That's the type of situation, that's the context that he wrote these words. And I love, as we get into Psalm 3, how David divides it up. Because the first couple verses are going to express the problem. They're going to look at the situation. And he writes it in a, in a way, he writes it in this parallel way, where he's going to put the words of the situation, the words that people are saying against him, the, the, the dilemma that he is living through, he's going to put that forward. 
This is one thought. This is one way to look at the evidence that is presented to you. And he's going to take the circumstance, he's going to take the hard realities that he's living through, he's going to take all the words of the world around him that are being said against him, and then he's going to say, but this is how I see it. This is what truth says. This is what God's word says about my circumstance and how beautiful a way to address a problem that is. That's exactly how we need to address our difficulties and problems. When we're going through that fire, when we're going through those hard times where it feels or maybe is that enemies are surrounding you, when your circumstances say that God isn't good, you always go back to his word to be reminded about truth. To remind that God is always good. God is love. God will be there with you through the hard times and he has a good thing to come out of this hard circumstances. That's exactly what David does. Notice in verse number one, he says, How many are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. He's looking at the circumstances. He's stating them for what they are. There was a massive amount of people that had risen up against David. An army led by his own son was standing at his doorstep, making him leave. This is true. This is the circumstances that he was in. And he continues, As many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. I love the way that David uses the the word Selah within this psalm. Selah was a pause, a moment of reflection. And he uses it to divide up this psalm. He makes his statement. This is, this is what is being said of me. This is what is being done to me. There is a massive amount of people that want me dead. And every single one of them, this multitude of people, are looking at my situation, looking at where I'm at, and looking at my circumstances and saying, God has abandoned you. This man who used to be after God's own heart, God has thrown him to the side. It is clear that God has abandoned him. And this was a popular thought. We saw this in the life of Job. When bad things, when hard circumstances came into the life of Job, what did his friends, his loyal companions do to him? Job, you're sinning. God wouldn't have breathed this if you weren't sinning. They abandoned him. Not only do they abandon him, they antagonize him constantly debating with him why he was sinful and had to get right with God. This is what the world was saying about David. God's not with you anymore. And that word help is the idea of salvation. There is no Savior coming for David. There is no help coming for David. And I love the turning point here. Because this is the situation. These are the circumstances. They seem dire. There's an army out to get him. Every single one of those army is making wild accusation about David. It's saying he is, he is worthless. He is, he is of no use to God anymore. And the, he, is, he, is, he is being dethroned by God himself. That's what they were making this accusation of David. It's interesting. As David looks at the circumstances, as he looks at the words of the world, the word that he uses for God is a very unique word, and I should say it's a very broad word, and not typically the one he will use to refer to God. It is the idea of, it is the word Elohim, and it was a general purpose word for God. It was the idea of the one who is in control, and in the broader sense of control, the one who ruled the universe. It's the same word as Lord. The one who rules and reigns. The one in control. It was very similar to a a pagan idea of what a god was. The one in charge. The one of victory. And frequently when we see this word throughout the Old Testament is both referred to is the same word that is used frequently to refer to pagan gods that is, is the one true god. It was to emphasize the strength, rulership, and authority of God. And it was frequently when countries went to war the victory, victorious country would say that they defeated the God. Their God was more authority. Their God had more power than the one they conquered. And that was the sense which the world around him was looking at David. as your God has abandoned you. Your power is gone. 
The one who has put you on your throne to rule and reign has left you alone and has abandoned you like he did with Saul before you. Your God has left you. But when David refers to God, he uses a personal name. He uses the name Jehovah. This was a unique title. You weren't going to hear Jehovah referenced to anybody else, any other deity, any other false idol. It was a unique name, a name given to Israel to refer to their God, the one true God, the I am that I am. It was a personal name given to Israel. It emphasized the personal nature of his God. And so when he says, Oh, but thou, O Lord, he is saying, My Lord, my God, the one who has defended me before, the one who has always been with me, the one who has delivered his people, my personal God has not abandoned me. There's this beautiful personal reality that he gets into. And in fact, as he looks at this personal God, he emphasizes the, the individual things that he does for him. Because he goes on, and as he, as he goes from this world's view of his situation, of his circumstance, to his proper biblical view of what God is doing and why he is not going to worry but have confidence in his Lord, he moves over to this name and refers to his God as the Lord Jehovah for the rest of the passage. In verse number 3 it says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. My glory and the lifter up of my head. And this is an amazing parallel to what is being said against him. Remember, the accusation is God has abandoned him. He doesn't belong as king anymore. He should just go hide in a rock and wait to die. That's the accusation. And David says, no, no, no. My God has not abandoned me. In fact, my God is my protector. He uses key words, this idea of the shield. But thou, O Lord, art my shield. This wasn't the big kite shield. This was a personal buckler type shield. A one used in hand-to-hand combat. It wasn't a large flanking shield that would protect the whole body or protect a a, a group of people as they went forth in in a marching type reality. This was a personal shield. It was a personal defense. He didn't say the walls of my city protect me. He didn't say, you are my tower that protects me, which are are more corporate ideas of protection. He says, you are my shield. You are my personal protector. You are the one who has always gone with me into battle. You are the one who has always gone with me as I was fleeing from Saul. You are the one who stood with me as I stood as a 14-year-old boy and faced down a giant. You are my defense. You are my protector. He says, but thou, O Lord, art my shield. A shield for me. And then he attacks the other accusation they brought against him. That God had abandoned him and that he wasn't right to be king anymore. Because he says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. And this idea of glory and lifter up of my head goes back to his God-ordained rulership. The idea of glory is his kingship. You are the one who made me king. It was by your command that I was anointed to be king by Samuel. It was your choice. Remember, when he was anointed, God had had, had Samuel go out to his father Jesse, and, and as he was going out to David's father Jesse, he had Jesse bring all of his sons before him. He went from the oldest to the youngest and brought them and stood them before Samuel. And God said, nope, not that one. No, not that one. No, not that one. Until he got down to the very last one. And he said, no, it's not that one. Jesse, do you have any more sons? Jesse says, yeah, I have the youngest. He's out in the field tending sheep, but you don't want him. He says, call him, bring him here. We're not starting this without him. And David stands before Samuel. God chooses David. God anointed him. His glory was given to him by God. His kingship was promised to him by God. Not only was it promised to him in that moment by God, it was promised to continue forward in his line. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God gives him the Davidic promise 
the Davidic covenant, that there would always be a king in David's line. And that promise will be, was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There would always be a king over Israel from the line of David. David says, you are my glory. You are the one who gave me all the glory that I can lay claim to. And interestingly enough, the second idea of the lifter up my head is David's confidence in God's promise. Because it was God who anointed, and it was God who was going to pick him up from this miry, destitute position that he was in, and was going to restore him to that glory as king of Israel again. He knew his God. He knew he was his protector. He knew that he was the one who gave him strength. He knew that he was the God of provision. And that's why he could rest in him. He looks at the person of God. You are my protector. You are the one who gave me my kingship. And I know you are the one who's going to restore me to the throne you promised. He had confidence in his God. Confidence in his protection. Confidence in who he was. And he carries that forward. I cried unto my Lord. He goes back into his own personal history. The times that he was running from Saul. The times that he was facing off against enemies in battle with a small army and still gained victory. He goes back to his history of God's provision in his life. How good an exercise that is for us to do in the middle of a trial. It's so easy to get hyper-focused on the future that we can't know and the problem that we're sitting in right now and forget about the countless times that God has protected and provided for us in the past. When David is faced with a trial, he goes back to look and examine the character of his God in his own history. He says, I cried unto you, Lord, with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. Isn't that a thought to rest on? That when we cry unto God, we're not crying helplessly. We're not crying unto a, a, a voided thought. We're not hoping on something that may happen. We cry unto a living God who hears and is there to help. So as David cried out, God heard him from his holy hill. God heard him. And then he continues on. It's a restful thought. And he continues on to verse number five. He looked at the history of God. And he looks at the confidence that he has in God. He says, I lay me down in sleep. I awake for the Lord sustains me. And this is both a looking at his history. Looking at the fact that God is the one who always keeps him going. God is the reason we wake up with life in our breath. God is the one who continues our life. But just for a moment, remember where David is saying this from. He is fleeing from a force who could easily kill him. And yet, despite all the hard, all the danger that sat at his door, he could lay down and sleep. I don't know about you, but if my wife sees a spider enter the room before we go to bed, I have to kill it before we go to bed or she's not going to sleep. When we think we're in any kind of danger, we don't want to sleep. And yet David knew his God and had confidence in his God that despite the hardships that he was facing, he could rest. He could rest in his confidence of his Lord. And it was a founded confidence because David did awake. And he awoke, and he blends this, this, this mixture of, of past tense and present tense as he goes through this account of God's character. He says, I laid down, my, uh, down to sleep, and I wo- awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me, round about against me. I won't be fearful, because I know who my God is. I know that he that is with me is stronger than any force that can come against me. I know that God is with me through the hard times. He is my shield. He is my protector. 
And I can face 10,000 people coming against me because I know that God is with me. And he looks at God's provision. He looks at God's protection. And he's going to look and have confidence in God's salvation. As he continues on in verse number 7, he says, Arise, O Lord. This is a call to God. A call to action. This is the part of David's prayer. He's, he's prayed and he's glorified God for what he has done. He's glorified God for the character that he has. And now he's praying. And he's asking God to protect him like he has done hundreds of times before and will continue to do. He prays to God. Says, arise. Call to action. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. And I love the way that David does this. Because even in his call to be saved, even in his call on the mercy of God, he's praising God in the middle of it. Notice how he's saying in the present tense, Save me! Save me, God! And he jumps back and says, You have already done it in the past. You've already showed yourself faithful in the past. So save me now. Save me, O Lord. And the last verse that he finishes off, this off with is he says, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Isn't that amazing? Those words came from a man whose life looked like it was over. Those words came from a man who had tasted betrayal. Those words came from a man who had spent years running from his enemy in the wilderness. Those, man, those words came from a man who had faced a lion and a bear, and it would have been very easy for David to look at all his situations, all the circumstances of his life, and say, I don't know why I keep trusting in God. It seems like trouble follows me everywhere I go. And yet, he remembers that every time trouble came, God was there. God was with him. When Saul was chasing him in the wilderness, God was there. He was the one that provided him salvation. When God, when, when, when David thought that he was, he was done and completely ruined when he walked into, into Gad with, this, with the, the sword of Goliath strapped to his back and he thought he was all undone, God still provided him safety. When David had sinned against God and turned his back on God, God still didn't forsake him. He sent him a prophet to convict him of his sin and turn him back to God. And when he, when he was convicted of that sin, when he recognized his wrong and realized that there was nothing he could do to cover it, nothing he could do to make amends for it, and prayed to God in that amazing psalm that we read in, in Psalm 51, Praise to God, this amazing prayer says, I don't deserve your mercy, but I beg it. God forgives him and restores him. David had seen the faithfulness of God. David had personally seen the salvation of God. He knew the history. He knew his own history. And God was the God who delivered. God was the God who saved his people out of Egypt. God was the God who continually saved David. And as David calls on this idea of salvation, he's calling him to save him physically. But he recognizes that God has saved him in, such a, in a much greater way. God does deliver David. And he lives on. And he's the king for a few more years. But his ultimate salvation, the confidence which he had, ultimately pointed towards that promise of a savior, of a great savior, who would come and save his people. God is the God of salvation. So in the middle of your, of your trials, in the middle of your difficulties, remember, God is the God of salvation. If he's worked out the greatest need that you have in sending a savior, what makes you think he'll abandon you in your moment of difficulty? 
Have confidence like David did in your God. And it's something which we're called to do. Confidence that David had in his God is something that we can have today and should have. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid for their terror, neither be troubled. Peter points to a reality in that passage. It says, trouble may come, but you have a great Savior who can work all that together for good. The worst thing that can happen to you on this earth is that you die, and what happens when you die here? Present immediately with your Savior. And so, have confidence in the middle of your trial, knowing that your God will not abandon you. He has already saved you. Have confidence that He will do it again and provide for you in your moments of difficulty. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the time that we have. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the confidence we can have in your person, Lord, in the faithfulness that you have for us, Lord, in the continual salvation that you provide, in the continual security that you bring, the confidence that we can have in you, Lord. Thank you so much for that. I pray that you'll encourage the hearts of your people as we go on this week, that we might have confidence no matter what we face whether it be bills needing to pay, be paid, whether it be difficulties in the workplace, whether it be hardships in family and in health, Lord. Pray that you'll help us to know that we have our confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You will turn with me, remember the number, I believe it's 374. Turn with me to 374, be thou my vision. We're going to be singing the first and the last of 374. Thank you so much for the night that we have, for the time that we have in your word. I pray that you'll help us as we go forward this week to find our confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. <clears throat>